Hello, my name is Barbara Kay, and on behalf of my co-host, Susan Pertnoy, and the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, I'd like to welcome you to our program, Mosaic. Our focus today is history, friendship, and understanding. Our special guest is Bruce Gendelman, CEO of Bruce Gendelman Insurance Service. We'll be back with our program and our guest after this brief message. What if you could change the world? You can. We can do it together. With the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, you are here and we are all connected. Together, we can enrich Jewish life, care for vulnerable populations, and build global Jewish community. That's what we do every day, here at home and around the globe. My wife is the light of my life. Being her caregiver is both a joy and a challenge. I'm determined to stick with it, but it can be exhausting. I need support. Morse Life is here to help us. We look forward to seeing them. Morse Life Home Healthcare. Morse Life, honoring senior living. Welcome back to Mosaic, and welcome to you, Bruce Gendelman. What a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure. Listen, this wonderful book, A Tale of Two Soldiers, Susan and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a remarkable book. Tell me why your father wrote this book. Well, this is his uh, personal memoir, uh, sort of a coming-of-age story uh, that really focuses on his uh, very trying experiences in World War II. Um, and in an unlikely meeting mm -hmm. where um, he befriended a deserter from the German Luftwaffe who became his very best friend for life. And on uh, our father's 85th birthday, my sisters and I basically had to plead with him to uh, put down in writing his thoughts mm -hmm. in a memoir. And it was primarily meant uh, for our family and for our, cho our children and, and his great-grandchildren. Uh, and he was very reluctant to do it because he really didn't want to talk about the war. We, we knew about aspects of it, but we really never had the complete full story. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we convinced him, and he actually spent every single day for the rest of his life, the next four years, uh, writing the book. And um, my father was an accountant by training. But it turns out he's a very good writer as well. He's an yeah, excellent it's, writer. Yeah. We enjoyed really it. And, yes. and the book was actually fully edited and vetted and completed a month before he died. Unbelievable. Wow. In the early part of the book, he talks about your grandparents. Yes. They are heroes in and of themselves, and yes. their story is remarkable. Can you share their trek to the United States? Sure. Typical of um, many Jewish immigrants and other immigrants, um, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather, decided to flee the pogroms in Russia. And uh, he had, he sort of organized his then-to-be wife's family. And uh, they had a very long trek uh, escaping uh, at night through, with, with boats. And he, my grandfather was very strong, and he would pull the boat up along the shore at night. He and built a, can a, a canoe, a canoe yeah. or something. And, and uh, you know, there's many of these stories, but it was really remarkable that they escaped and made it. And, and they, they came to Milwaukee, uh, which I call the old country, and, um, you know, became very uh, successful immigrants. And uh, my father, of course, was the beneficiary of that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. In 19, I think it was 1943, your father decided that was the war was going on. He decided to enter the uh, U.S. Um, Army. That changed his life forever. Yes. Um, Not only his. I mean, it transformed everybody. Right. But right after Pearl Harbor, he was a student at the University of Wisconsin, and um, he decided to enlist. And he did, and he had uh, basic training. And he goes through it uh, in depth in the book. And he went from one, uh, one experience to another, uh, he encountered some very significant anti-Semitism in the U.S. Yeah. Army. Uh, and by luck, uh, my father had never shot a gun before, but by luck he, he was a very, became 
in his first experience with the gun, he was an expert marksman. And that really changed his life because he kept going to different schools. He, he, uh, he went to sniper school, then he went to an engineering school, uh, and they, the, he did some intelligence training. And um, all of this uh, sort of kept him f from D-Day, but very shortly after that, uh, he was uh, organized into, into a unit and was, was shipped in and became a sniper mm -hmm. in the very front lines of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, yeah. Wasn't one killed when he was right walking with him? Yes. The, Shot, and he was covered with blood? Yeah, that was, um, that was a shell uh, landed right in front of him, mm -hmm. and the uh, force of the blast was absorbed by this other soldier, and my father was covered in blood. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in addition, the sound and the shockwaves from that uh, made him largely deaf throughout the rest of his life. He only had about 15% hearing. Wow. So he struggled with that, uh, but he survived. Um, there's another event uh, when he was uh, trapped and when the panzer tanks were coming, uh, where he was in a foxhole. And to save bullets, uh, the Germans would just move the tanks up this hill at the very front of the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge and just grind the soldiers to death in the foxholes. And my grandfather told my father, he was, my grandfather was drafted in the Russian army. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather said, if you ever get in trouble, remember your faith, remember God, and to say the Shema. So my father tells the story where he started whispering the Shema and, and saying it louder and louder. And uh, as the tanks were approaching, and sort of miraculously to him, there was a fog that came up, and it was just enough for him to escape, to, to escape by crawling on his belly without a weapon over, over the hill. And uh, when he got down to the bottom, he ran, but he made a choice uh, to go through the German lines mm -hmm. rather than going back because the U.S. forces were being routed, and he figured he'd have a better chance of survival trying to go through the lines. Mm -hmm. God, I tell you, it's a miracle. It, it really is, but there, there is a little levity in the story. Could you tell about the incident with the chicken soup? Yes. Uh, so this is actually before he was captured, um, and it, he was in a unit. He was the only Jewish fellow, I believe, in the unit. And so they were on patrol, and um, they came across a farmhouse, and, and they were, were not well fed. They were largely starving. And uh, my father, um, uh, they caught some chickens. And the sergeant said, well, Max, you're Jewish. You must know how to make chicken, chicken soup. soup. <laughs> make, make some chicken soup. So mm -hmm. my grandmother, who was a marvelous cook, apparently never taught him how to make chicken soup. So what he did was he, he took his helmet, took the lining out. He boiled some water. He, he plucked out a few feathers. He put the chicken in there. That's all he did. And the water was sort of lukewarm. And uh, when he thought it was done, he took a sip, and it was so vile that he threw up. Right. <laughs> so that was the end of his chicken that, soup. Yeah, that was the end of. <clears throat> you know, something that's interesting because of his background and because he understood Yiddish. That was also what saved his life. In another another point, when he was at, with the SSS or SS, uh, two S's are enough. Um, they um, they were looking at the people that they were captured. And they looked at one of the young men in front of him, and his name said Goldstein. Mm -hmm. And uh, the SS said, stehen Sie auf. And nobody understood. And they picked up this Goldstein, pulled him up, and because his name was Goldstein, he was a Jew, they shot him in the head. Yes. Explain what happened after that. So this was at a point in time where um, they had been prisoners for a while mm -hmm. and were very malnourished. They all had dysentery. Uh, and my father, because he grew up, he only spoke Yiddish until he was five years old, um, understood the German well enough. And uh, after he saw this fellow being shot, my dad stood up behind and said, OK, guys, get up. These guys aren't messing around. Stand up. And the officer comes up to him and points the revolver at my father and starts talking to him in German. And there's a great passage in the book, and, and in English, um, you know, he asked what his name was, and he said, my name is Max Gendelmann, like N-N. N-N, German. And he said <clears throat> something like, are you, uh, a, where, where are you from? 
And he said, well, I'm from Milwaukee. And, and the, uh, the SS officer said, Milwaukee, it's a good German city. And my father said, sure. Jawohl. And he said, uh, you know, are you a German boy? And my father said, yes, I'm a German boy. And then the officer said, this is all back in Yiddish. Uh, and the officer says, well, your, your English is, your, your German is very bad. And uh, my father sort of just shrugged his shoulders. And he said, OK, you're, you're now our translator. And uh, because of that, uh, it actually, in a few instances, saved his life because he could understand uh, the German. Mm -hmm. He became the liaison. Mm -hmm. And then later, when he was in the third prison of war camp, uh, it was that knowledge of German and being the li liaison that allowed him to meet his lifelong friend, Karl Kirschner, who was the deserter from the Luftwaffe. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a, a miracle. I really, we, the whole thing is a miracle. Nonetheless, let's, let's talk about how he met his friend. So um, my father en ended up in a little town called Linda, Germany. Linda, Germany is near the Czech uh, uh, German border. And they were sent there in boxcars for about five days. And the, the cars were strafed. Even the Germans put a Red Cross on them. But uh, they did that on all their trains. So the cars were strafed by uh, American fighters. And uh, aside from that, from the dysentery and the disease, many of the men died. And uh, when they finally got to this camp, it was in the middle of the winter, and they just had a barbed wire uh, set up, and they dumped these men out. Um, and my father, being the liaison, um, uh, was asked to organize the men. And um, so the uh, Germans would say, oh, we need eight men to do this. And, and so time went on. And there was, a, there was a lady, an old lady, whose farm they had taken over, the Germans had taken over. And uh, she started approaching my father because he, he had some access to go to the, the commandant's uh, room. And he started giving her, him rutabagas to mm. eat. And, and um, it was like a gift from be, God. Because that's what they grew on this farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, uh, my father met through, the, through this lady at, at night, one night, at midnight, a, a man about his age, a boy about his age, 20 years old. Um, through the fence. He was on the other side of the fence. His arm was in a sling. And his name, we later learned, was Karl Kirschner. And he was the grandson of this lady. And uh, they, they started having these conversations, which are you know, very interesting in the book. But Karl, um, at the next night, snuck him up to um, the grandmother's the house. And the grandmother made him a feast some meats, oh and, and they, they had some little, they had some cognac, cognac, cognac yeah. and they smoked cigars. <laughs> and there's a very acute story in there. Uh, a, Carl asked my father, well, do you play chess? My father said, yes, I play some chess. Well, it turns out my father was a chess champion in high school. And so they start playing this chess game, and my father easily beat Carl the first, the first game. And Carl looked very sad. And my father figured, he doesn't really know what's going on here. He doesn't know who Carl is, <laughs> but he better let him win. Right. So um, they, they did this for a few days. And um, Carl was feeling out my dad because he was concerned. They could hear the artillery from the Russian front coming. And Carl didn't want to be overtaken by the Russians. He thought he would be killed by them. Um, and so he approached my father and said, Max, um, I would like you to help me escape to the West. On that note, we're still going to take a break. We'll be back with the remainder of our program right after this brief message. Don't forget what you were saying. <laughs> my wife is the light of my life. Being her caregiver is both a joy and a challenge. I'm determined to stick with it, but it can be exhausting. I need support. Morse Life is here to help us. We look forward to seeing them. Morse Life Home Healthcare. Morse Life. Honoring senior living. Welcome back. Bruce, you were in the middle of telling us about Carl and Max's escape. Yes, yeah, so their planned escape. Uh, so my father was, you know, very uh, clever. Uh, sort of, a, he called himself a different kind of soldier. He was an expert marksman. But here they are very deep in, in German uh, territory. 
they know the war is over. Uh, the Russians are advancing. Um, and Carl was afraid for his life. And so my father said, fine, I'll do it. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen here with these sol soldiers. I don't know if the Germans, the SS, are going to shoot us all when the war is over. Well, let's do it. But there's a few things. You have to listen to exactly what I say. And we need, we need supplies. He said, I need uniforms. I need papers. We need food. And I need a weapon. And Carl's grandmother says, I'll have all of that for you tomorrow. You're leaving tomorrow. So the next night, they organized, and the grandmother had this little sack of food wrapped in a handkerchief. They had a tandem bicycle. They had two German uniforms that didn't fit. Uh, and they had a revolver with about nine bullets. Wow. And my father said, well, I guess that's good enough. And they were about to set off. But he said to, uh, in Yiddish, he said to um, the grandmother and to Carl, he said, but there's something I have to tell you. He said, I'm not a German boy. Uh, I'm Jewish. And Carl said, actually, Carl spoke English. And he said, Max, of course I knew that. He said, it makes no difference to me. Uh, we'll be friends, and let's go. But before, before they left, tell us about the soldier. Oh, yes. So uh, that night, someone was watching my, another soldier, American soldier, was watching my father sort of escape through this little crack in the fence each night. And he came, to, he came to him that night and said, I know you're planning something. I know you're planning escape. His name was Nick Grano from Ohio. And he said, if you don't take me, I'm going to tell the Germans. Whoa. And uh, my father didn't know what to do, but he, he said, fine, but you're going to listen to me. And uh, if, we, if we make it, you owe me a marker for the rest of your life. <laughs> he said, fine. Oh, so the three of them left. And they had some interesting stories along the way. They were picked up twice by the Germans uh, and got through the American Don't lines. Don't tell everything because they won't read the no. book. All right. <laughs> you know something? Your background and what ultimately happened and the relationship that they had is, is remarkable. Yes. Uh, that was a very, very important part of your life. Did it, how, did, how did your father's story and the relationship with Carl affect you? Uh, enormously, um, which isn't in the book. But uh, Carl was a big part of our life. He was at my wedding. He, he, they would see each other at least once a year. They would talk on the phone a lot. Carl became a very successful doctor in California. And uh, I, when I was in high school, wanted to become a doctor. And my father said, well, if you're going to be a doctor, you have to talk to Carl. So I got on the phone. I'm talking to Carl. And it's between my uh, sophomore and junior year of high school. He says, what are you doing this summer? I said, well, you know, I had some plans. He said, cancel all your plans. You're going to come live with me, and I'm going to show you what it's like being a doctor. So I flew up by myself to San Luis Obispo, California, and I lived with Carl for three months. Wow. And he had, uh, he actually has three sons, two sons about my age and one much younger. And I lived with them. And I would get up with Carl early in the morning, and he was a pathologist. And we would go to the hospitals. And at the end of the summer, it was very interesting. And at the end of the summer, he said, so what do you think? I said, well, I think it's very interesting. And he said, do yourself a favor, don't go into medicine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but didn't he give you his prized possession? Yes, he did. He, he gave me, um, which I still have and I still look at very often, he gave me a very expensive microscope. And I was always very involved in science, and I used that microscope a lot. And so we were very, very close. Why, I say something. I wanted to, I, Bruce is such a remarkable photographer. And why we, you know, it's so interesting to find out how this, life impacted you, I have a feeling that it made a difference in terms of what you photographed. You have a collection, and we'd like to share it with uh, our viewers, uh, some of it, if you don't mind, and then we'll come back to Dad's book, okay? Of course. The first one that you're going to show is the one about the train. Yes. Can I explain about that? So uh, several years ago, my wife and I took a, a trip to Berlin. Mm -hmm. And being an, I'm a very, very passionate and avid amateur photographer. But I always take pictures, and I always have. My grandfather gave me a camera when I was 10 or 11 years mm -hmm. old. Uh, but when we went to Berlin, uh, I was actually very haunted by the city, mm -hmm. knowing that my father had fought the Nazis, that the US had, and allies, defeated the Nazis. And here we were in the center of Berlin, where the Reichstag was and where Hitler lived and worked. You wrote something beautiful. Yes. And I, I wanted you to have a chance to 
to read that. I titled this photograph, The Last Train to Death. 100 meters from the tracks are extremely luxurious estates that were owned by the elite of German society. Every morning, the Jews were either marched through the neighborhood or brought by truck to the train station, where they were loaded onto boxcars, counted and logged by the clerks, and then shipped to the death camps by the SS. Mm. The tracks have only recently been lined with memorial plaques. The plaques recede from view with one per day and the number of, in quotes, passengers per day. The SS, the German Railway Company, was paid a per head fee. The following is an excerpt from the testimony of a Holocaust scholar, Raul Hilberg. The Reichsbahn was ready to ship in principle any cargo in return for payment. And therefore, the basic key was that the Jews were going to be shipped. So long as the railroads were paid by the track kilometer, so many pfennigs per mile. The rate was the same throughout the year, with children under 10 going at half fare, and the children under four going free. But payment only had to be made one way. This is a photo of the last train from the Berlin station, which was March 27th, 1945, and contained 18 Jews. Never mind that the war was lost and almost over, the shipments continued still, nonetheless. They sh still ship wow, them out you there. Know, you know that's so impactful. You Isn't have, that yeah, it is. You're, you have your next one. I think is about th the clerk's office at the train station. Yes, yeah. which is I, I, also very powerful. I call this photo the train men saw nothing. This window in the Berlin train station in the elite neighborhood that was used to send the district Jews to the death camps. The clerk sat behind this window at the desk and counted as each passenger was boarded on the train by the SS. The passengers' images would have been reflected in the glass as they passed the window, and the faint images of the clerks perhaps were seen by the passengers. The old building stands empty, the window is cracked, the paint is peeling, and the angle is disorientating. Wow. Oh my goodness. You know, first of all, that, 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 paint, that uh, photograph speaks to you, you know? Even though with the commentary, but it really speaks to you even if you don't say anything about it. Yeah. Wow, my goodness. You know, you have tons of them. Well, you've got to do, do, do. I would like to talk actually about this one, which is my favorite photograph in this collection I call Reflections on Berlin. And this, oh, one, that's this one's amazing. called yeah. Distorted Reality. This photograph is in the area outside the Jewish Girls' Day School. As I walked the back of the building, I looked up and saw a reflection in the window, this chimney. I was instantly struck by the distorted image as a ghost of the crematorium at the gas chambers. The window's old double pane glass reflected the light of the chimney, making it difficult to tell what is real, what is a reflection or an illusion. The girls looked out of this window from the classrooms and looked up into the window from the courtyard. And they themselves ended up in smoke in other German chimneys. Oh, my goodness. That's wow. Incredible. I don't know. You know something? Um, it had to, all this had to change your life something um, in, in, in a very dramatic way. Uh, really? Don't you think so? Oh. I mean, his father's experience, the, the, writing the book, taking the photographs. Your sister also went on a journey, a photographic journey, yes. too. Well, Can you tell us what she discovered? Yes. Well, I have two wonderful older sisters. And, this is um, Nina, I think. Yes. My sister Nina uh, has retired from being a, a Jewish librarian in Jewish day schools, mm. and her husband as well. And, and they have become now artists. And my sister does quilts, and my brother-in-law does sculpture. And uh, they were in Germany very recently um, and decided to figure out how to get to, this, to Linda, Germany. Oh. So my sister, being a librarian, contacted the library in Linda. One thing led to another, and they, she had a meeting with the mayor of Linda, Germany, who said, yes, I'd be we sent him the book. He said, I'd be delighted to host you, but I don't want to tell you any of the details. Just plan on spending the day. So my sister and her husband uh, went there, were greeted by the mayor in his office. They had some coffee. Uh, they had a translator. He spoke English, but had a translator with them and said, okay, the day's going to begin, and in the next room there are two people I want you to meet. And they went to the next room, and there was a, an old man 
uh, and his son, both didn't speak English. And the old man turned out was Karl Kirshner's first cousin. He was, oh, in his, wow. he was in his 90s. That's amazing. And he didn't really know the details of what happened to Karl. He knew but he, he knew he was a doctor. He knew he escaped Germany and never came back and uh, was a doctor in the United States, and that's all he knew. So my sister um, filled in some details, with, and then the mayor said, it's time we go to the next venue. They got in the car, drove two minutes, and they went actually to the site that was the prisoner of war camp. Oh. which was the Kirshner family home. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, Carl had told us that there's nothing there, it's all been destroyed. Well, it wasn't. The, the two main structures were still there. The area where my father was a prisoner of war, basically outside, and there was a little shed, the shed was gone, and the outside barbed wire area is now a soccer field. For the, oh, my goodness. And so my sister and her husband met the owners, and it's now used as a garage, Mm -hmm. and um, several other townspeople, and they had a tour, and they took pictures. And then the mayor said, now we have another venue. And he took them to a little guest house where there were other townspeople and uh, asked my sister to give a book talk. Oh, oh my goodness. So the, nobody knew why she was there, and she starts explaining uh, that my father was a prisoner of war here, and there were some questions. You mean a guest worker? And said, no, my, my father was an uh, American prisoner of war. And then when uh, she mentioned, well, he was a Jewish prisoner of war, that surprised them as well. But she said it was truly the, one of the, or if not the most important days of her life. They kept her there for six hours. They kept bringing out coffee pastries. and sausage and mm -hmm. pastries and beer. And they wanted to hear more and more. And... Uh, one-on-one, -on -one, the people were wonderful. Because this was in uh, part of East Germany, virtually no one spoke English, so the translator translated. But it was a very uh, touching experience for, for both parties. Yeah. You know something? Been. Before you get off the air, and then we don't have time, and I'm so sorry, because we could go on for a long time. Would you read the yes. um, Wolf Blitzer statement on the front of the jacket of the, uh, of the, of the book? This World War II memoir is a remarkable history of survival and friendship. If an American military sniper, a young Jewish man from Milwaukee, can befriend a German Luftwaffe pilot and become lifelong friends, then we can all certainly hope for a better world. Wolf Blitzer, CNN. I want to tell you something that makes me teary. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to tell my father's story. I loved it. Thank you, too. And thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next week when we take another look into the Jewish world. Goodbye from Mosaic.